Let's turn now in God's Word to uh, Titus 2, uh, the book of Titus, the letter of Paul to Titus, chapter 2. So God's Word, as it is given to us in Titus 2. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled, Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority, let no one disregard you. So far the scripture reading. The text for this morning's sermon is Psalm 130. So let's turn now in God's Word and read Psalm 130. We note there that it is a song of ascents. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchman in the morning, more than watchman for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. So far the reading of Psalm 130. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, Psalm 130 has to be one of the most beautiful chapters in God's Word. We have noted that it is one of the songs of ascent, which means that it is one of those songs that were traditionally sung by pilgrims as they made their way to the temple in Jerusalem during one of the major annual feasts. In other words, this was a song that related to the people's joy and worship and service to the Lord God. It's a festive song a song of thanksgiving. And what the psalm conveys, what the psalmist by the Spirit conveys, is that our life is only possible. It depends on the Lord alone. 
And of course, that was the understanding that is the idea ingrained by the Lord into the people by way of the festivals in Jerusalem. That they receive life through sacrifice, through death of another by God's grace. Yes, because of God's love and faithfulness, we have life and we have a future. So that is what Psalm 130 is about. But let's look at it in detail now. And we do so under this theme. God rescues us from out of the depths. That's how I summarize the message this morning. God rescues us from out of the depths. And we're going to see three things this morning. First of all, what that means to be in the depths. So we'll be looking at that from verses 1 through 3. Then secondly, what it means to rise out of the depths. That's verses 4 to 6. And then finally, what it means to be above the depths. Verses 7 and 8. So I'll repeat that for those who are taking notes. God rescues us from out of the depths. We see one in the depths, two rising out of the depths, and three above the depths. So first then we look at verses one to three about what that means to be in the depths. The psalm begins with a cry of desperation. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord, O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. The image here is someone who is in deep, deep trouble and who needs help. Here we can think of a biblical image such as we sang from Psalm 69 this morning. A person who is in deep water and who cannot swim. Who is beginning to slip under the waves and drown. Who is sinking into the abyss and life is almost over. It's a an image in Scripture that is symbolic of great despair. And we only have to think of the great flood in Genesis to understand the great despair of those who would not trust or believe in God. But this is a despair that we all deserve. And so, it is something that we also recognize we are in apart from Christ. So not only in Genesis do we read of this or in Psalm 69, but we also uh, know of a very specific image like this. Consider what the prophet Jonah is writing about. About his experience of despair of being thrown overboard from a ship into the sea. Perhaps you know the story of Jonah, how he was called by God to prophesy to the people of Nineveh, but did not want to do that because he didn't want the people of Nineveh to repent and receive mercy, and so he fled from God, and he ended up on a ship, and then the ship got into a great storm, and then Jonah informs the sailors the storm is because of him. God is punishing uh, the boat, punishing him particularly, and they're all going to perish as a result. So he says the only way that you can be delivered from death is if I perish alone, and so throw me overboard, he says. And then we read that he's swallowed up by a fish a great fish, but when he is in the fish and he's still alive and death is near, we read these words from Jonah 2. I called out from the Lord out of my distress. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried. 
You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. He talks about when my life was fainting away. So that's the picture. It's a picture of despair and horror and terror. It's a picture of crying out for help. And the clear teaching here is that Jonah and the psalmist of Psalm 69 and the psalmist of Psalm 130 cannot help themselves. The clear picture is that self-help is not an answer to the depth of distress now Psalm 69 is dealing about dealing with the despair of one who is surrounded by enemies. Our psalmist today in 130 is describing something far more serious, a, a far greater enemy, a, a more terrifying predicament than physical drowning. As our psalmist explains in verse 3, if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? The psalmist is describing a human who is in a state of sin. He is describing the reality and the consequence of sin. He is describing us all, sinners, who deserve to be held accountable for our sins. He is explaining that God hates sin. Sin is rebellion and hatred against the creator, the faithful covenant God. And God had warned man in paradise that the wages of sin will be death. If man sins, man will be cut off from the land of the living. Man will be cut off from God, physically, spiritually, and eternally. What a horrible predicament to be in, brothers and sisters. The consequence of our sin is that we all should go down into the watery grave. We all should be part of the great flood of God's wrath. And to spend eternity away from God in hell, too horrible for us to imagine. Our psalm describes man drowning, sinking, dying, guilty. Nothing is worse. But let's say it this way. It is by God's grace, brothers and sisters, it is by God's grace, boys and girls, that God places this awareness of our deserved death and of our need of salvation upon us. And so that brings us to our second point, where we consider rising out of the depths, particularly verses four through six. Out of the depths of sadness, of horror, the psalmist cries out to God for deliverance. As I said, it is God who's placing this on the heart of his chosen one, to pray for mercy and forgiveness. And then we read of a different image in our psalm. The longing for mercy from the watchman on Zion's walls. Longing for the morning to come. You see, at a certain point, the watchman who is guarding the city and the walls of the city is looking for the first signs of dawn which will release him from his duties, or in the least, will mark the beginning of the end of danger. 
The psalmist repeats this too, more than a watchman for the morning. Because he wants to express the heightened sense of longing here. He's adding force to that longing. You see, the deeper the knowledge of the depths are, the stronger the longing to be saved. And so we read in our psalm about a watchman who eagerly, anxiously, who is tired of the long vigil and the night of trouble and the constant threat of danger of enemies and attack is looking for the dawn of a happier day and he cries out to God. Well, what does this teach us, brothers and sisters? This, along with the previous verses and the image of drowning, teaches us that our troubles, our sins, do not separate us from a merciful God. Rather, they actually bring us to God. God puts it on our hearts that we have sinned and we acknowledge sin and so through repentance, the psalmist can plead an audience with God that sin makes impossible. The psalmist can climb from out of the depths of the misery of sin to confession of it and to the hope of deliverance. Just like the traveler who is on the way to one of the festivals in Jerusalem is steadily climbing the slopes to Jerusalem, to the mountain of God, so the psalmist anticipates, and that anticipation keeps growing, the mercy and love and forgiveness of sins by God's grace. And it's in the knowledge of that deliverance that the psalmist adds to his cry for mercy a shout of profound joy. Verse four, but with you there is forgiveness. And then we're reminded of Jonah again. When I read through chapter two, I only read the parts that expressed his despair and the depths that he was in. Now I'll read the parts that are interspersed in those verses that speak about deliverance. Jonah says this, in the belly of the well, of the whale, well, he, he, he expresses this in, in response to God's deliverance. He says this in verse two, out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. And then in verse 6, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever, yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. And then verse 7, I read this already, when my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you in your holy temple. So here is our God, beloved. In the depths of our misery, he hears our cries. He is not far from us. He is near us. He is listening. He is forbearing. He is forgiving. He is saving. He is not keeping a record of our sins. Psalm 130. Indeed, when the psalmist says, if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand, then he's talking about how we have to give account of all our actions. And that the Lord has a book in which all our deeds are written in. And we have to give account for that. What this means then is, when, it, when the psalmist says, if you should mark iniquities, or if you would record our sins, then what he means is, if you would consider our sins not paid for. That is to say that there is no stamp paid for in that accounting book. The promise of the covenant of God and the promise that the psalmist makes known is that our sins are paid for. 
And the ground for that hope, beloved, and the ground for that joy of the psalmist is explained in the New Testament more fully by the Apostle Paul in Romans 3. He says this in verses 23 and 24. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Although we fully deserve to die for our sin, to go down into the watery grave, it is out of pure grace that God sent His Son into the world to pay for our sin with the shedding of His blood. As Paul writes in verse 25, Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith, God takes away his wrath, or his wrath is removed through the blood of his son. Jesus Christ was sent, and Jesus Christ gave himself up for us to redeem us. He died on the cross to take away God's wrath against our sins forever. This mercy of God is reflected in our psalm too this morning in a, in a striking way. It's in the way that we read the word Lord or the name Lord in our text. If you look at Psalm 130, you will note verse 1, Lord in uppercase letters. That's a, a translation of the Hebrew Yahweh, which is a reference to our God of the covenant, the covenant that God made with his people, the covenant of grace. And when the Israelites called upon that covenant of grace and called upon God for his mercy and forgiveness, then they would use that name, Yahweh, appealing to this aspect of God. But we also read, for example, in verse 2, Lord in lowercase letters. And that's a translation of the Hebrew Adonai, which means Lord or Master or Ruler. And the Israelites would use that form to emphasize God's sovereignty. They're appealing to God as master, as ruler, as king, as the one who controls all and who also rules our hearts. The psalmist, therefore, is appealing to both aspects of God, both parts of God, for lack of a better term. We see this throughout the psalm, by the way. Verse 3 has it again both different lords. It comes again in verses 5 and 6, and then again in verse 7. What the psalmist is saying is he needs more than just mercy. He needs more than God being simply a supreme ruler. He needs all of God. And beloved, this is the same God that we call. This is the same God who will save us from all our distress. We need all of God. He gives all of himself to us. He is Savior. He is our Lord. He is our ruler and king. This is the Christian God. The loving, merciful ruling God of our lives. And that brings us to our third point. When we consider verses 7 and 8 about the depths, being above the depths. Beloved, our God, our covenant, merciful, loving, ruling, master God, did not send His Son to this earth only to grant us forgiveness of sins so that we can just keep on going sinning. But we read in verse 4, with you is, there is forgiveness that you may be feared. That you may be feared. Now that's not the kind of fear we read in the Bible sometimes, or like the psalmist is expressing at the beginning, 
the fear of drowning, or worse, the fear of uh, bearing the terrible wrath of God against sin. Nor is this simply a servile fear of, of a powerful God, but it's a healthy fear. It's a reverence. It's an awe for the majesty of our great God. It is pure respect for a great and gracious God who would give up his own son to death on a cross to pay for our sins as miserable rebels. And in this instance then, fear means faith and obedience rising above sin and death, rising unto new life, that you may be feared. That is, man in a knowledge of God's power and grace rising rising above his problems. With the Lord, verse 7, there is steadfast love. With him is plentiful redemption. Abundant, abounding life, in other words. Here is mankind rising to confident hope, steadily climbing towards assurance, rising out of the watery depths, having the morning sun begin to shine on the walls, ascending to the walls of Jerusalem for a festival. This is plentiful redemption shining very brightly against the darkness of the psalm's beginning. Quite rightly, beloved, on the solid basis of our great God's grace, the psalmist exhorts us to hope. Hope in the Lord, he says. That's what fearing needs here. Waiting, hoping, and obeying, serving a new master. Here is God redeeming, renewing, restoring, regenerating, Where sin once abounded, now grace abounds all the more. Think of what we read together in Titus 2. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes, we are living, we are hoping, we are waiting for the perfection that is yet to come, but begins already now, where ungodliness and worldly passions, though they surround us and fight for room in our hearts, we say no to that sin. Because salvation has appeared. Christ has appeared. The Holy Spirit has has been given to us and has appeared. Let us live then self-controlled lives, beloved, in humility. Let us live in purity, eager to do what is good. So in conclusion, what does this psalm teach us? It teaches us that sin... Our sin causes us to spiritually drown, to die, so that we have no hope at all in ourselves. But because God is merciful and he is near to us and he works in our hearts, we can confess our sins and we have hope as a result because our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Our help is in God, our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, Christ crucified. And in Christ, not only are we saved and delivered from eternal death, but we are also lifted up out of our sin. We are lifted up out of a life of evil and we can live for him in joy and fear and obedience. Amen.